Lord, and uh, we'll open up our Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 5. We're going to do the fives this morning. And uh, we hope that uh, you enjoy uh, the, our singing uh, half of the program, and we'll have a little more singing before we close the program. Uh, we, uh, I just want to uh, take a couple of minutes and say hello to all of my big family out there. I've got brothers and sisters all spread all over the country, you know. Some, my, I have two sisters living out in Roswell, New Mexico, and I have uh, one sister living way up there in uh, New, New Hampshire, and another one living in uh, northern New York. Kathy is in uh, northern New York, up in Malone, New York, I believe, and, and, my, uh, and uh, Alfreda, she's living up in uh, New Hampshire. I have a brother living down in Florida. I have a son living down in Florida, so I got family all over the country, you know, spreading here and there. I just wanted to say hello, <clears throat> hello to all of you, and if you pick up this program on YouTube, I'm going to be speaking to you this morning, and to everyone else out there who uh, calls on the name of the Lord, and this is just a reminder, you know, sometimes uh, you get that... Uh, that uh, idea, you say, well, I'm preaching to the choir, or I'm singing to the choir, and sometimes I am, but to those of you who happen to have come into this program, and you don't know what it means to be saved or unsaved, we're going to talk about it this morning. Saved from what? Saved from the wrath of God. The time is coming. We are living in the last days, and even as we see the things uh, unfolding around us. You might say, well, these things would have happened anyway. But you know what? When we look on the scriptures and we see them and the way things are unfolding, we know that the end is very near. But now let's pick up our story this morning in the uh, Gospel of Luke in chapter 5. And we're going to go down to verse 30 and we're going to start from there. And Jesus here is uh, uh, calls Matthew calls him uh, to the ministry, you know, he was at the, uh, he was uh, sitting at the receipt of custom, and uh, Jesus called him, said, come, uh, come with me, and uh, he left everything, and he went with Jesus, and then held a, a dinner for Jesus, and so we pick it up in the home of uh, uh, Levi, or Matthew, and we pick this story up, how and, and, and what happens? And then we have a little parable in this story, too, that we got to look at. So verse 30, but there uh, scribes and Pharisees sees, uh, 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 they murmured against his disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answered them, they are whole, they that are whole need not a physician. But they that are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but the sinner to repentance. So here we have in the first uh, stanza of this little story, we see that uh, Jesus is at dinner and there's all sorts of people there. There's sinners and the publicans who uh, the Pharisees thought were like a second class citizen. We have uh, second class citizens today. Uh, maybe they don't have any money or they don't. They don't uh, 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 have the uh, best fine clothing that some people might have, you know. But uh, Jesus was sitting with these people, and they were all eating together, you know. And the Pharisees, they saw it, and they pointed their fingers, and they said, Look at this man who calls himself the Son of God. Here he is sitting and eating with the sinners, and uh, so Jesus responds and says, oh, but who would a physician need? A physician doesn't need somebody who's well, but he comes to the sick and he has to approach the sick. And so here we see the, that Jesus comes to the sick. Now here, uh, uh, here we know that Jesus came uh, to call sinners to repentance. And we're going to look at a scripture in the book of uh, Romans. And in Romans, we're going to go to chapter 5 and read verses 1 uh, through 11. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith unto this grace wherein we stand 
and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength in due times, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die, but yet preadventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. And here we are. That uh, here we have that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Here's that story. And so now what happens? Jesus comes to this world. Who do you think he's going to come to? He don't come to call the righteous to repentance, but he comes to call the sinner. And the truth of the matter is, the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is not one person in this life who could say that they are without sin. And so that we need to have that atonement we need to have that in our life. And so Jesus demonstrated to us by going to these sinners and to, to call them into the kingdom of God. We should never feel that we're better than anyone else. We are better off because we have the blood of Jesus Christ shed abroad in our hearts. But we're not better than anyone else. We were just like everybody else before we came to know Christ. Now briefly, I just want to say that uh, uh, what does it mean to be saved? And we go through this here, and last week I spoke from Romans chapter 10, and where it spoke about being saved, but I want to just say it today also for this program, that there are two groups of people on the earth, the rich and the poor. No, that's not it. How about if we said there's two groups, the tall, the basketball players, and the short ones, the uh, rugby players or whatever it is, you know? No, 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 no. And it's not the black or white. It's not the yellow or the green. It's not the color of your skin that sets you aside or apart from any, uh, uh, the real two groups. There are only two groups that really matter in this life. Now listen to this, John, Frank, Peter, Ralph, listen to what I'm telling you. Mary, Debbie, listen to me. Listen to what I'm saying. There are two groups of people on the earth. Not the Presbyterians and the Methodists. Not the Roman Catholics and the Jews. There are two groups on the earth. And that is the saved and the unsaved. On that day, when God comes to judge the righteous and the wicked... He will divide them into two groups. Those that are saved and those that are unsaved. Those are the only two groups that count. And guess what, folks? You belong to one of those two groups. It's impossible to join another group. There is no other group. There's not the almost saved. There's not the I'd like to be saved. There's only the saved and the unsaved. And you're one of those two groups. Now, if you're the unsaved and you don't realize it, make sure of your election. Make sure that God is on your side. Repent toward God and call upon God. The Bible says, whosoever calleth on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You want to be saved? You want to join that group? 
Never mind, well, I joined this church and I joined that church. They give you a little card and they tell you, oh, yeah, now you're a member, you're doing good. That don't do you any good unless you're saved. Unless you're saved. And, and let me uh, now reiterate this again because we mentioned it last week and a week before that, that when you join the church of God, not this local body here, but that church, that one church that Christ established, when you belong to that church, that is the only true church. And you may call yourself a Methodist. You may call yourself a Pentecostal. You may call yourself a Baptist. And Baptist, remember that. Remember that. <clears throat> you got to be a Christian. You got to be blood washed first. Then you can be a Baptist. Then you can be a Methodist. Then you can be a Pentecostal. Or whatever denomination that you wish to call yourself. You have to belong to the one church. And you have to come into the kingdom of God. And this is what Jesus was doing. And this is what Jesus had come for. And this is why he was with those sinners. Now as we go on, we're going to look at this a little more. We're going to go to uh, Luke chapter 5 again and look at uh, verse 33. And uh, <coughs> as we go down here now, uh, we look at the next uh, situation here. And let me... Turn my page. Uh, verse 33. And they said unto him, <clears throat> Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? And likewise the disciples of the Pharisees. But thine eat and drink. Now you get this? This was the accusation that was brought against Jesus and his disciples. And I, I want to say that... that there is only one accuser of the brethren, and that is the devil himself. When you begin to accuse the church, be careful. Because you are taking the influence of the devil, and you're, and you're using that influence of the devil to, to argue and lament against the church of God. Now, let me, let me just say something. Before we get into this, let me just say something. If I meet people that I don't know, and they call themselves Christians, I might ask them a question, but I'm not judging if they're saved or not. I just want to know a little bit more about them. And that's not a judgment. For example, uh, one of the things that I like to do is when I meet a new Christian, I ask them, well, where do you fellowship? And this kind of helps me to know a little bit more about the person and uh, who he is and where he fellowships. Because you know what? If uh, I meet a man and he tells me, well, my favorite joint is the bar down on the corner. Whoa! I know he's got problems, huh? <laughs> if he tells me, well, my favorite show is such and such. Whoa! Okay, that's where your desire and your hunger is. If I say, well, where do you fellowship? Well, I go to Life Church. I go to uh, 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 Shiloh Bible Church. I go uh, to uh, this church or that church. Well, it helps us to understand who they are. That's not, that's not a judgment against their faith. I'm just uh, interested in knowing those things. Uh, 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 it helps me to develop a, a relationship with someone when I do that. And maybe that's just me. Let's uh, look at this again now. <clears throat> so we find here that uh, uh, worship uh, through prayer and fasting. You see, prayer and fasting is a form of worship where we are worshiping God through these things and it becomes necessary. I know that some of our prayers, when we pray, you know, it's all uh, I need, I want, a gimme, gimme, gimme. But sometimes we have to learn that a prayer is broken into worship and there is a part for asking those things that we want from God or that we desire or need from God. And then there is the part where we acknowledge and worship God and understand him and give him praise and honor and glory for who he is, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the host of, the, of our church. He is the head of our church, praise the Lord. Okay, I'd like to look in the book of Psalms First, talking about prayer and uh, fasting. And in the book of Psalms, we have a prayer here. It says, uh, give ear to my words. Psalm 5. I told you we were in the fives. Psalm 5 
uh, uh, verse 1 and 2, it says, Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King, my God, for unto thee will I pray. My voice thou shalt hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. Here is a prayer. We have a prayer unto God that it is necessary. It is, it is something that God wants us to do. It is, a, it is a reception of our faith. It shows that we believe in God by prayer. Direct my prayer. And we'll go to, uh, let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians five, uh, 7 and 5. Oh, we're back in the fives. Here we are. Defraud ye not one another, except it be with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your inconsistency. So this is uh, speaking about uh, a husband and wife, that they would, they would uh, uh, have fasting and prayer in their life, but they must uh, have a consent uh, to fasting and so on and so forth, you know, and other things that, uh, their other parts of their relationship, you know, are all that they would consent have consent with one another to do the things that they're doing so that they might have a, a time of fasting and prayer. So the Bible teaches us about fasting and prayer. And uh, Jesus here, as we get back to Luke now, let's go back to uh, Luke here, and uh, 34, and he said unto them, Can ye make the children of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the day will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then they shall fast in those days. So there is a time, the bridegroom is gone, we're waiting for him to return. This is a time when there is fasting and prayer, where we're meditating on the things of God, when we desire uh, to draw nigh or close to him with something, that we fast and pray. There's nothing wrong with fasting and prayer. And so uh, here uh, we're told that we give ourselves to those things uh, amongst one another, even in the church. You know, uh, we have to be careful that uh, we, uh, we call a fast. Uh, let's say the church leaders call for a fast. You know, let's be careful with that because there are some that may have a problem with it. Uh, maybe they can't. And if they have no desire to fast and you force the fast on them, they haven't, you haven't done anything for them. The fast has got to come from the heart, not from the pulpit, okay? Did you get that? Okay, now let's go on. And he spake a parable unto them. This is the main part of my message this morning, is this parable, two-part parable, a patch and a bottle. A patch and a bottle, here we go. All right, so Jesus says, No man putteth a piece of new garment upon an old, if otherwise, then both the new maketh rent, and the piece that was taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old. And no man putteth wine into old bottles, else new wine will burst the bottle, and shall spill, and the bottle shall perish. But new wine must be put in new bottles, and both are preserved. In the first half of this, we're talking about a patch that's put on, and this is an allegory, you know, uh, shows that the old patch or the new patch might tear. It, it just is not compatible with one another. But what is Jesus talking about here? Talking about patches and bottles. Here is the, the life of the man who is sitting at table with Jesus, and Jesus invites him to come into, uh, 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 into the home and Jesus is inviting and calling this person, and, and, and he wants to come. But the old must go away. We have a scripture in uh, 2 Corinthians. Uh, 2 Corinthians here. And uh, what chapter? Oh, look at this. Chapter 5 and verse uh, 17. Here we go. 
Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And so in this instance, we see that it isn't good to try to put the new patch on the old material. <clears throat> and we have a song that we sing. It says, I'll tell you the best thing I ever did do. I'll tell you the best thing I ever did do. I took off the old and put on the new. You see, uh, you can't live with your old ways in the new church of God. You can't, you can't, God, the Spirit of God will not come and dwell upon the old clothing. You know, it's like a little story of a man, a young man, he, he works construction, you know. And so he, uh, he goes out all day, he's working in the ditches, he's shoveling, he's, he's sweating, you know, he sweats, he, he comes home, and then he realizes when he comes home that he has a date. Oh my goodness, I have a date. Uh, yeah, and I don't have much time. So he takes his clean clothes and he puts his clean clothes right on over his old construction clothes. He puts them right on and he goes out on the date, you know. He gets in his car, he goes, picks up his little girlfriend, you know. And she comes up to the car, she looks at him. Whoo! She says, what is that smell? And, uh, and he says, Oh, he says, I was in a hurry. I didn't have time to take my old work clothes off. So I just put on my new clothing over my old clothing. You know what I mean? I'm telling you this in a form of like an allegory also. And uh, so she says, well, I'll tell you what. I'll sit in the back and I'll open a window. And he's not too happy and she's not too happy. You get the story? If you're going to come into the kingdom of God, you've got to take off the old garment. You've got to take it off. And God will give you a clean garment. God will give you a new garment. And before he puts that garment on you, he is going to wash you with the water of the word. <clears throat> now we have read uh, a few weeks ago, we were talking about Jesus who described being born again. And he says, you must be born of the water of and of the Spirit. And that water is the washing of the Word. That Word washes you and cleanses you. And then after the Word washes you and cleanses you, then the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells within you. And you're nice and fresh. You're clean. You're saved. You're a new person. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Now, and this is, the, uh, this is the idea of Christianity. There's a lot of people, you know, who say, well, I, yeah, you know, I, uh, you know I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm not a Jew. I'm not, uh, I'm not a Hindu. I'm not a Muslim. So, you know, I must be a Christian. Uh-uh. You may call yourself a Christian. You may have gone to church all your life since you were a little girl or a little boy. You hear me, John? You hear me, Ralph? You hear me, Fred? How about it, Susie? Do you hear what I'm saying? You may have gone to church all your life, but you never met Jesus. Not really. You've heard about him. You know his stories. You know the little story of Jesus and, uh, and uh, how he fed 5,000. You know the story of how he walked on the water. You learned all those little stories. But you never really came and had Jesus come living into your heart. You might have thought you had, but you've been wearing those old clothing and you haven't changed your clothing. You haven't allowed God to wash you with his word and put a new garment upon you. And God will put a new garment upon you when you come into the kingdom of God. Ah, let's get to the second half of this uh, parable, another part of it. It says, No man putteth new wine in old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. Okay, so here is this uh, allegory that shows us the tearing of the old, the new wine in old bottles. What is the old bottle? Maybe that old bottle, you know, it had old wine in it, and that old wine, you know, it had a certain flavor. It had a certain desire. It had something that you just liked. You just got used to doing it. 
and it became a custom, it became uh, something in your life that you loved, and oh, that's, uh, uh, you know, oh, I'm, it's hard for me to change. And so you've got that old bottle of wine. Now, Christ comes with a brand new bottle, it's new wine, and Christ wants to give you the new wine, but he's not going to put that new wine in that old bottle. Now that new wine is not just the Holy Spirit, but it is the fruit that comes with it. It is the fruit of the Spirit, which is love and joy and peace and long-suffering and temperance and patience and kindness and goodness and all the things that come along with that new wine. And he's going to want to pour that into a nice, clean bottle. You know why? Because the bottle will break. It'll break down. It won't be able to stand it because you've still got the taste of the old wine in that bottle. Now, you know, in, in the time that, th that these were written, the bottles were not glass bottles. They were goat skins. And a goat skin, you know, the goat skins is a good example because the goat skin, you know, would absorb a little bit of the flavor of that wine and would take it on. And after a while, you know, there, there would be uh, maybe something there that, that, that would get into the pores of that goat skin and it would stay in there. Some of us have things that are right into the pores of our, uh, our very being. Uh, you know, uh, uh, an envy, an anger, a hatred, and all those things that we have in us that uh, have to go. And I'm going to speak about that just briefly. And I want to say that there are some things that we need to take out of our life. And uh, let me find myself here. Ah, yeah, here we are. <clears throat> and so we have these things that are in our life, and I'd like to talk about them just briefly here. This is the stuff that gets into that old bottle. And so here we have it. We have anger. Sometimes, you know, you, you have the spirit of anger that's in that old bottle. And uh, then you might have the, uh, uh, like certain lusts that are in that bottle. So we have anger and lust. And then we have selfishness. The me first, everybody else get in line behind me attitude. And there's a lot of people out there who have that today. They're spoiled, rotten. And they want everything and they, it's right into the very pore of their being. And then there's pride. Oh, do you know who I am? I know the I am, but I don't know who you are. <laughs> there's that pride that we have in our life. When somebody says something that we don't like. When somebody does something that doesn't fit in with us or they've embarrassed us in some way and we'll never talk to that person again because of our pride. And then there's that final one that I'm going to mention is hatred. Ugh. Hate. I hate this and I hate that and I hate the other. Uh, these five things, anger, lust, selfishness, pride, and hate, these five things are permeated or, or saturated right into this bottle. And there they are. Now can you imagine we're going to pour the new wine in. Oh, we have quite an argument here now because of these things that are in there. But here's what Christ wants to do. Christ will come to you and he will come with this word of God, this precious word, which is the water of the word and he will put it into that bottle shake the bottle up and empty it out put some more water in shake it up and empty it out and he'll clean that bottle out you say well how does that work well when you begin to read the word you find out for example the bible says here jesus said listen he said you ought to love one another and you ought to love your neighbor as yourself and i'm telling you you know you even ought to love your enemies. Now once that is washed into that bottle and it cleanses that bottle, you see there won't be no conflict with you because of your hatred. God will take the hatred out of your life. And then Jesus says, he says you ought to think of others more than yourself. And when 
That washing of that word comes in and takes out that pride out of your life, then he can dump in the new wine. And the same goes for the lusts and the anger and all the other things that we have that God is going to take them out of our life and give us a new life. So here, here we are. We're the bottle, you know. And so God washes us and cleanses us and then he puts the new wine. And that new wine is the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes in, you know, there is a fruit that he produces, the Holy Spirit produces. Now, in the old wine and in the old bottle, you were producing a fruit also. And uh, your uh, fruit, uh, let me just uh, find this and so that it, can I can make it a little clearer if I, uh, if I sh uh, just show it to you here. <clears throat> when you had the old bottle... And you have that stuff in the old bottle. Here's, here's the type of fruit that you, were, that you are producing or that you do produce. It says that, uh, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these? Adultery, emulsations, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envying, murders, drunkenness, reviling, and the sight the such of like of which I tell you before as I told you before in past time they that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God these are the unsaved okay these are the actions of the unsaved but when Christ comes into your life and he washes that bottle and he puts his spirit in you now look But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, long-suffering. Long-suffering is patience. You're very patient, okay? Gentleness. Are you gentle? Goodness. Do you think of good things? Do you always look on the good side of things? And faith. See, God gives you a sprinkling or a... Uh, uh, he gives you a faith. He gives you the power of faith to produce more faith, okay? Meekness. You know what meekness is? Meekness is uh, uh, being able to hear the word of God and do it, okay? Some people, you know, they, you know, I remember when my kids we're little, you know, sometimes I would t ask them to do something and they would do it, but they, I knew that they didn't want to do it, you know. Go brush your teeth. Go comb your hair. Go do this. Go do that, you know. And they would go. They would give me this stuff. They would go. You know, like the, yeah, you get the shoulder, you know. They do it, but they do it in contempt. That is not meekness. <clears throat> meekness is... When God tells us something from the word, we are hungry to do those things that God asks us to do. And we do it without giving him the shoulder or without giving him a hard time about it. And if you're able to do that, you know that you have meekness. Right? And temperance. And against such, there is no law. So here we have to have those, th those old things washed out of our life. And God will do it. You can't do it. I heard uh, one time a man told me, I'd like to come to your church, but I have some vices in my life and I'm trying to get rid of them. And as soon as I'm able to get rid of these things, my smoking and my drinking and my running around with, with uh, women or whatever it was that it was bothering him, he says, as soon as I'm able to give those things up, I'll be coming to church. You can't do it that way. You've got to allow Jesus to take those things out of your life. It is the word of God that will wash you. Not the psychiatrist of this life. Not the psychologist of this life. Not the immoral teachings that we hear in the school systems. Those are not going to help you. What you need to do is call upon God and ask him to wash you with the word of God. And he will wash you and cleanse you and give you a new life. Amen. And then once you're washed, he will replace those things with a precious fruit and you become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Now the last verse, and then we're going to close. Here it is. 
uh, here is verse 39. And whoa, this is a tough verse. Look at this. It says, No man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth anew, for he saith, The old is better. Isn't that true? That if we have been living our old, old life, doing those things, and then you hear somebody tells you, here's something new, we don't desire it. We want the old, we just, we're happy living the way we are, you know. But I want to tell you that if you keep drinking the old wine and keep living in the old wine at the end of the age, the Bible says that you're going to have to pay for those things that you do. And the Bible tells us that you will be put in the place of the goats, not the sheep, the goats. And the goats, the Bible says the angels are going to come and cast those goats into a lake of burning fire. So this is a warning to you. I'm warning you that you have to desire the fresh new wine, the Spirit of God, the washing of the Word of God in your life. You need to have that. Call upon Him. Tell Him you want Him in your life and He'll change your life. No man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth anew, for he saith the old is better. Huh? I know some people that say the good old days, you know, even in the church, you know. Oh, I used to do this and I used to do that. And, you know, I was a, one of those guys and I did this and that and the other. Stop boasting about what you were and begin to witness of what you are. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your precious word. Speak to our hearts and to our minds, Lord. Help us to understand, Lord, that there is only one way into heaven, and that's through Jesus, the Son of God, the King of kings. Help us to understand that, Lord. Help us to uh, display that and to uh, 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 propagate that to those around us, Lord. And we pray for the churches around about, Lord, that different denominations that meet, Lord. But we understand that there is only one church. And we pray for those saints of God, Lord. And those that want to come into the kingdom, we, we encourage them, Lord, in the name of Jesus. To come into the kingdom before it's too late. Help us all to do the things that are pleasing in your sight. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Praise, Praise the Lord. Praise we the Lord. have a meeting here Sunday morning at 10 o'clock in uh, Manlius Center. And uh, uh, you can call us at 656-8572 if you want more information about the meeting. We have uh, uh, this program is broadcast on Time Warner Cable, which is now called Spectrum. And it is uh, Sunday afternoon at 4 p.m. and Thursday morning, 10 o'clock a.m., 10 a.m., on channel 98, channel 98, Time Warner Cable. If you don't have Time Warner Cable, and you happen to have picked this up someplace on, let's say, on YouTube, because I, uh, we put these programs on YouTube, all of the programs, we have over 200 programs on YouTube, and uh, tune them in. There's plenty of good stories there and good singing, good gospel songs you can find there. And uh, to all my friends and all my family, and to all those that uh, uh, meet with me and see me, I, I want to say that God bless you and keep you until we meet again in Jesus' name. Jesus is the only way.
the only way, folks. 